can word it, because it's really just a feeling that I feel. Everything that I have is just two years ago. And in a way, you're still kind of telling the same story. If that opportunity opened up, I would play. But I'm still kind of battling that battle. It was a historic night in Springfield. Senior Bilkis Abdul Qadir blew Rebecca Lobo's scoring record out of the water. I mean, anything is possible. Never give up. Practice. Your dreams come true, basically. I literally graduated, went home, gathered all my bags, and went to the airport. So that's how fast things were going. Where's Bilkis? Right here. Stand up, Bilkis. Just so that we, I want everybody to know, she's got heels on. She's five five. It's an athlete on her way to Memphis. Bilkis is an inspiration not simply to Muslim girls, she's an inspiration to all of us. Bilkis Abdul Qadir has been invited to the Pro Am Combines. These events give the top college seniors in the country a chance to be evaluated by foreign coaches. I wasn't ready for what was about to happen, you know, like I was just trying to play. For the first time in her playing career, Bilkis Abdul Qadir has hit a roadblock. Basketball's governing body, FIBA, has ruled that bans players from wearing equipment that may cause injury to others, including headwear, hair accessories, and jewelry. In the wake of terrorist attacks in Paris and San Bernardino, for these historic figures, just as for the other 5 million plus Muslims in the United States, this has been an especially visible month of their faith and world events have echoed across American society, making this question a complex one to answer. What is it like to be a Muslim athlete in the United States today? It's hard being a young Muslim woman in America. It takes strength to walk outside and look different than everybody else. I pray that it gets better, but I think, you know, there's so many mindsets that would have to be changed. People kind of look at you different when they see Muslim women. They have this stereotype that they're quiet, that they're submissive, that they're not supposed to do these certain things. Everybody thinks, yeah, it's just a sport. But when I play basketball, I worry about nothing. It takes me out of real life. I was gonna finish school, I was gonna play basketball. I was gonna do all this stuff, and now it's just like a huge question mark. Right now, I don't know who I am. Am I anybody without basketball, you know? Am I still myself? history of myself. Um, I am born, was born and raised in Springfield, Massachusetts, which is also the birthplace of basketball. That's also where the Basketball Hall of Fame is, so if you're ever up that way, go check it out. I am the youngest of eight, so I have four sisters and three brothers in which we all played basketball, so um, I like to say that it was kind of unique for me to pick up the ball and play. I am the daughter of two uh, people who converted to Islam. So my mother converted when she was very young. My father as well. My, my Umi was uh, raised a Christian. And my father didn't really have any religious background. So uh, my siblings and I were all born and raised as Muslim. So again, basketball was the sport that we played in Springfield. In a lot of ways, basketball was the only way for us to uh, get out and get an education. And I remember a specific conversation that I had with my, my Umi one day. It was myself and my brother right above me. Uh, we were kind of the last two to kind of go off and, you know, get ready to go to college or prepare. And I was around 12 years old. And she looked, she looked at us dead in our faces and she said, look, she said, I can't afford college. So you're going to have to figure it out. You're going to have to get a scholarship, whether it's academic, whether it's through a sport. So, um, you know, kind of, I need your help. You know, I need you guys to help out. So alhamdulillah, uh, my brother and I both received full scholarships to, to universities. My brother went to Bentley College in Boston, and then I 
uh, played at the University of Memphis. But that day, something hit me uh, when my Umi told me that. You know, of course, mothers are always really the backbone of the family. And I didn't want to see two of my father struggle financially. Um, I've seen it. And so my goal was to play basketball and be good at it. So I remember uh, sleeping with the basketball. Um, I remember watching my brothers play and trying to do every move that they did repetitive over and over again. I would be outside, up and down my, uh, my block, dribbling the ball. And wherever I could find a basketball to hoop, like that's where I was. And I mean, like, my, my father, I remember cemented, put our first hoop in our backyard, and it's still there to this day, it's all rusted up. But um, that's where we played a lot. And so, again, that was it for me. Like, I chose basketball. That was the sport that I committed all my time to. Um, my parents and I traveled from many, too many places just so I could play. They invested a lot of their time in it because they saw that I loved it, and it was a huge passion for me. And like I said in that film, you know, when I stepped on the court, it was a place where you forget about everything. Like, it was my stress reliever. Um, when I was going through things, I wanted to play. And it just took your mind off a lot. And growing up, um, just being one, an African-American and a Muslim, it's tough because you have to prove yourself in a lot of different ways. Um, you have to pr prove yourself to the Muslims who aren't African-American. You have to prove yourself to the people who aren't non-Muslim that you fit in. Um, and that you're just a normal human being. But I remember the place where I felt most comfortable being a Muslim, being a Muslim woman, and being African-American was on the court. Because when you play a game, you're out there to win. There's, there's nobody really going back and forth about what you look like or what you're wearing. At that point, that ball goes up and you tap it and, it, and it's time to play. So, when I was a freshman in high school, that's when I began to wear hijab. And I'm going to tell you, I didn't want to do it. I did it because I didn't want my umi to be upset. I didn't want her to be upset. I have older sisters who, you know, everybody has their family and everybody chooses their own path. Um, so I've seen my umi get disappointed at some points. And, um, you know, the worst thing you want is that disappointment from your parents. So I remembered, you know, all the women that I see growing up, growing up had hijab, wore hijab. So I'm like, I know I had to do it, but I didn't understand it. I didn't like it. It took me like two weeks to go to school. So I forgot to mention I was homeschooled all the way up until eighth grade. And uh, so my first year in like a public school, I was uncovered. I looked like everybody else. That next year, here I am, um, randomly happened kind of in the middle of the school year. And so it took me two weeks to go back to school. I was sick every morning because I was like, Umi, no, I'm not ready. She was like, well, when are you going to be ready? I'm like, I don't know. I don't know. And I remember going to school the first day wearing hijab and my head was down on my desk. People were asking me, like, what's wrong? I tried to wear a hood. Of course, the teacher's like, oh, you can't wear a hood in school. And I'm like, it already looks like I have a hood on, so what's, what's the difference? <laughs> And I remember it was a struggle. It was a struggle. And again, once the basketball season hit, and uh, I showed up all covered up the first game, people were confused, like, is that the same girl from last year? And um, they figured out, of course, it was me. And that's when things kind of started to take off. You know, I was like, getting, I was well known, one, because I was pretty good at it. I was scoring a lot of points. Um, you know, I was getting recognized for that. And then on top of that, just looking different. And so, at a young age, being, what, 14, 15, having that pressure, having that image to uphold as a young Muslim woman, um, it's challenging. Especially growing up as a Muslim, when you're, when you're born into it, you can't choose it. So, as a person who converts to Islam, that's what, you, that's what your choice is. You chose to be Muslim. So, for us young people or the generations who have been born into Islam, for us, it's taught to us like... It's a, like, you know, autopilot. We know that we have to pray. We know that we have to fast. We know all these things, like it's just secondhand nature, but we don't understand why. And as a young person, we don't understand why. That's just the truth. And at some point, just like somebody who converts to Islam, you're gonna have to choose it. So when I first chose Islam was when basketball was taken away. I was known 
as the Muslim girl who plays basketball. I was known as that girl, that girl with the scarf who plays. Um, but my image was the Muslim hooper. So when basketball was taken away, I was just a Muslim. So for me, I'm like, man, am I doing that part right? Am I being a Muslim? And I realized when I hit that crossroad, like I said in that film, I had to make a decision. And I felt the most stress or some type of little, I guess, an ounce of depression, something like that when I was going through that time in that film early on. Just figuring it out, like questioning everything. Like, is it sad for me? Like, why would Allah take away something that I loved? I didn't get it for the same reason that I was doing it. That was my contradiction. So I was well known for being a hijabi hooper, for wearing hijab while I played basketball. And then that same hijab was the one that kept me from reaching my dreams. So I was torn. I'm like, it was not adding up. It's not adding up. I was ready to take it off. I didn't express that to anybody. And that was probably the worst thing that I could do. I didn't know who to tell. I didn't know who to talk to. Um, People would come up to me all the time and say, why don't you just take it off and then put it back on after the game? And I'm like, man, that sounds logical. At that, at that moment, I'm like, no, it's not that easy. Like, it's just not, you know, I'm kind of lying. It's just not that easy. You know, it means a lot to me. And it really didn't mean a lot to me at that point. Hijab didn't mean a lot to me at that point. I didn't understand for it to, to mean something to me. And so I remember the last resort that I felt was that I prayed. And that I realized that there was no person no organization, whoever, could help me get over this hump that I was battling, whether it choose my Islam or whether, or, or whether it was gonna be basketball. So I remember for the first time in my 23 years of life, however long I have been praying, I prayed for the first time and I felt it. I remember praying and I remember where I was, I was in my room, I was in, I was in, I was in grad school, and I'm in my room and I'm just like battling with it with hijab, just like, what, why, why am I going through this? And I went to Sujood and I started crying and I'm like, oh, this is brand new, I have never cried in my life. But at that moment, I realized that I needed a lot. I needed him because there was nobody else doing it for me. And it was the craziest feeling that I felt. And I pray that I, you always want that feeling. It felt like something was being pulled out of my heart. And I don't know what it was, but I know that I finally felt my prayer and I finally realized that, you know what? Everything that I was questioning led me right back to Allah. Everything. So for me, I remember the next day, I was probably going to a basketball practice and I was struggling with wearing hijab. You know, there's all these different styles now, but for me, I was wearing like the, the turban style every day. And I remember going to a game, I think, and at that moment, I was trying to fix it. I was trying to tie it up. It was just not going on right. And I'm like, what is going on? Like, it just wasn't tied on right. I put it around, and it was like perfect. And I'm like, this is beautiful. So I go out in public. Everybody at the game, mashallah, she's really looks so pretty. I've never seen. Oh, they weren't saying mashallah, I'm sorry. But they were saying, oh my gosh, Kisi, that's my name. And you look so nice with it that way. I like when you wear your scarf that way. And I'm just like, Really? I never wanted this way in front of people because I was just so afraid to do it. Always when I prayed or went to the masjid, but never in public. And at that moment, like, Allah was just showing me little signs. I'm like, why are all these people thinking I'm pretty? I think I look terrible with it this way. And I really did. For all the times when I, when I first started wearing the job, I'm like, I don't want to wear it like this because I just didn't feel pretty. But after that salah where I, where I cried, I'm like, you know what? I need to just stand up and do what's right, because then I was getting emails and tagged in pictures and social media of little girls with their hijab on, with their little tights and their basketball gear saying that they wanted to be just like me. And I'm like, Kisi, you gotta step outside of yourself. Like, it's no longer about me. Like, this is bigger than me. And I realized that if I don't stand up, who's gonna really do it? I was the only one in that position, only one. And what I realized is, and what I try to spread when I'm doing these speeches, like never in my life that I dream about speaking in front of people. It's so, to be up here in front of you and sharing your weaknesses is you have to be vulnerable. And I wasn't that type of person. Like, I didn't want anybody to see me cry. Now I'm just a cry baby, I cry all the time. But it's crazy the path that Allah will close to give you a better one. 
And I know that being a young Muslim woman, I can only speak for, for women right now because the pressures that we face, brothers, you don't understand. You don't understand what it's like to go outside and look different. And I said that in film, you don't understand. And Allah did this for a reason. Because you all have to, to, to blend in a little bit to do what you do for us. But at the same time, we bear so much weight just by walking out with hijab on. And so what I can ask from you all is to support us during our struggles or during times when, you, when we feel the heat from the media or whatever the case may be. But as young Muslim women, we have to do what we're supposed to do. And I know it's hard because we want to feel pretty. We want to fit the mold kind of that is shown on Instagram or whatever else. But Allah is protecting us through how we're supposed to dress and how we're supposed to act and what we're supposed to say. Like it's protection and it took me forever to figure that out. Four years ago, I always say I felt like I became Muslim when I prayed that salah. But I knew Islam for a long time. But I never felt it in my heart until Allah tested me. So basketball was my first test of life. I had to figure out that it didn't, the ball meant a lot, but it didn't mean that much for me to stand up on a day of judgment and get questioned and say, why did you take your hijab off? Like, I couldn't answer that in my head. I'm like, there's no way that when I'm about to stand in front of Allah and I'm gonna tell him that I wanted to play basketball, it didn't add up. It still doesn't add up. That's how I knew. And so for us as young people, and even as adults, we have to give Allah his time. And that's what I figured out that was gonna help me get through. I looked at something, it was a post, I said this to the girls earlier at camp, that we have our whole day, and I'm gonna ask you, how many, how much time do you think we spend praying throughout the day? Include your sunnahs or whatever if you pray your sunnah. How long do you think it, it takes throughout our whole day? Somebody throw out a number. 25 minutes. 20, you said 25? Okay, somebody else? 30? So what I read, 48 minutes. So we have a whole day, and Allah is asking us for 48 minutes. But when we pray, sometimes we don't. And if you do, it's love my brother, love my Going through the positions all crazy, not letting our bones rest in each position. We're rushing through. And we have 48 minutes to pray, five and the extras. There's no way we can't make time for Allah. And I was just here earlier, this Jumai, and Brother Dawood gave his khutbah. And essentially, that's what he was saying. Like, are we preparing for what we should be preparing for? Or are we too busy trying to fit in? And I see it all the time. And I know what it feels like as a young Muslim girl to want to fit in. I know what it well, what I see for young boys, young men, do you want to fit in? We have to let it go. Like, what we do is for the sake of Allah, and that's it. That's it. And it's hard to understand. I battle with it every day. I battle with it every day. It's like always an inner battle. Like, man, you want to do some things, but you know you can't. And it's, just, it's scary. I know it's scary. Being in college, being the only Muslim on your team, really being surrounded by non-Muslims all the time is the hardest thing because you fall in with them so easily. So easily. It's so easy to just slip up and do what they do. And you don't even think that is wrong. You start to make excuses. Oh, no, it's just a little bit of this. It's fine. I can go there. It's fine. But it's not. And at some point, you have to stop it. So I know for us, it's time to not be afraid to be Muslim. If you have to pray in your office, pray in your office. Brothers, if you want to wear a kufi or a thobe to see how it feels for us to walk outside and feel different, do it. Like, why not? Grow your beards. Do whatever you have to do to be Muslim. Right now, we're afraid to be Muslim sometimes. And, and it's, I know it's hard, but we can't be that anymore. We're the only faith that has a set, set rules, set laws to follow. The only faith left that has that. And we take it for granted. So what I have to say, what my main message is, is to really, it starts with prayer. That's it. Praying five times a day and doing it and trying to feel it. And you have to fake it till you make it. Because sometimes you're in Salah and you're thinking about a thousand different things. 
You might need to pray it again. I felt like I need to do that a few times, a lot of times. But it starts with Salah. And I know for me, that's what brought me back to my deen and my Islam. And again, it's still a struggle every day. Every day is a struggle. Trying to, trying to kind of find your way. But I know that keeping Allah first is what keeps me going. Understanding that whatever he has planned is what his plan is. And we cannot change it very much. I know Dua can change a lot of things. But accept the things that happen. And it took me a while to accept that I wasn't going to be a basketball player. And that's what I thought. Still to this day, I'm probably going to get the question, so I'm going to answer it now. Am I going to play? Just in October, FIBA has removed the rule and made it effective so that not only Muslim women, but Jewish men who wear the yarmulkes can play, Sikh men who wear turbans can play. So it's not only benefiting the Muslim community, it's benefiting a lot of others. However, um, I don't know, I've already started life in a way. It's been three years since I competitively play. I still play every once in a while. But it's just tough, like, am I going backwards? Um, I can say that if the right opportunity presents itself and, you know, that's what I'm supposed to do, then I'll probably take it up. But, you know, Allah knows best. And right now I know I feel at ease to know that I pray that Allah just puts in place what's best for myself and my family. So, um, and then my main goal with the whole Muslim Girls Who Too, why I'm here this weekend, is that um, I want to use the sport of basketball like it, like it helped me just break down walls. Because I remember stepping on the court, even in college, and people yelling out all types of crazy stuff to me. I would be dead silent on a free throw line, and somebody would yell out, She's wrapped in a king size sheet. I remember that. I'm like, first of all, it's a terrible joke. What do you mean? What? <laughs> also, another person said um, that I looked like Osama bin Laden's niece. Don't know what his niece looks like, so I don't know where he got that from. Just terrible jokes. But I realized that, you know, when, when I did walk into gyms, I got a lot of stares, a lot of people nudging the next person next to them and pointing and laughing. I would be so mad. I'm, it, it, Still today, it still is hard for me to just smile and keep it going, try to, you know, keep the sun together. But when I was on the court, I would go to my teammates like, y'all, I'm going to slap somebody. I'm sorry, but I'm tired of everybody looking at me crazy. But I realized that when they saw that I could play, those stares and all those blank looks, they would come up to me after, and it would turn into questions. Like, oh, um, you're a great player, but why do you have that on? So for me, I had to process, like, you know what, Kesey, this is actually a point where you can give your dawah. And it was so easy just for me to shoot a basket and then somebody come ask me, why do you have that on? And that's where it all started, every time. Why do you have that on? And that, you know, that conversation goes and it just takes off. My teammates, I would be the, f a lot of the times, my teammates, especially in college, they'll be like, you're the first Muslim person I've ever met. They'll be like, I didn't know y'all were cool. Like, yeah, because I'm not human, so. But it would be so cool. I would, I would even have the teammates come with me when it was time to pray. I would leave practice or we would be on the road traveling. And I'd be like, all right, y'all, I got to go pray. And just the respect that I have for myself and that I had for Islam, even before I had my change and my change in identity and all of that, they would always be quiet when they would walk in the locker room. They'd be like, he's just praying, y'all, be quiet. Or we all lived in the same apartment. If I didn't have my hijab on and they had a friend coming over, they'd be like, oh, no, you can't come in. They'd be like, why? My friend ain't covered yet. And then, you know, they'll let them in after I'm together. So just the respect that you have for yourselves around your non-Muslim peers, even your Muslim peers, set the example. But I would have my teammates come pray with me. Keith, can we pray with you? And I, and I was like, or can I watch you? And I'm like, it's weird, but yeah, just stay to the side. And then... There will be some of my teammates just wanted to feel something. They'd be like, you, can, I, can I pray with you? I'm like, yeah, sure. And I remember this. We were in like, um, what is that place called where you have all the arcade, arcade games? It's huge. I don't know if they have this here. But anyway, we were there. I had to go pray in the back room. They left the games that they were playing to come pray with me. And they looked and they were like, I don't know what you were saying, but I felt something. And I'm like, that's a lie. In my head, I'm like, shoot, that's a lie. I already know what it is. But literally, that happened, what, three and a half years ago. My teammate who prayed with me at that moment 
messaged me randomly. We don't talk every day. And she said, Kesey, I remember that day I prayed with you. And she said, that was the most peace I felt ever in my life. And it was like, subhanAllah, like, you don't know how much you have an impact with people, just being you. So, inshallah, you all can take something from this. What I want you to do when you leave is when you pray, this goes for everybody, and I still challenge myself, is to pray and pray past. Set an alarm for 10 minutes. Try to pray longer than 10 minutes. Try to allow the alarm to go off before you finish praying. Like, allow you time, allow yourself time to really give Allah's time that he that he truly deserves. So with that, I will end. Assalamu alaikum.